now we are moving on in chronology. We are in the 80s now. Um, there, um, William Latham is a big guy, and uh, to be open, Herbert and uh, I, we never met William personally in our lives, but we knew, of course, we knew his work, and Herbert had also correspondence with him. Not, I think it was not by mail at that time, it was by letters. Um, Will, William helped developing software for the first evolutionary simulation programs, and this was done at um, an uh, interdisciplinary IBM research center in UK. And he is a trained artist, um, and that's, of course, uh, the, the reason that he used this software also for marvelous uh, artistic creations, animations. So uh, the, the works like, uh, uh, like uh, Tom Mikulic, uh, who, who wanted to get into motion, he perfectionized it with technology and with marvelous software. And today he is professor of computer art in, uh, in the Department of Computing of, of Goldsmith University in London. And William, it's a real Big honor to have you here, and I'm looking forward. So, and thank you, Suzanne. And wonderful to be talking here in Herbert Franker's memory. And, and for me, his first book on computer graphics was one of the reasons why I got into computing in the first place. When I was a young student at college, I picked up this book and has a massive influence on me. Okay, so today I'm gonna to get through quite a lot of content, hopefully not too much, the clock's on me, I think. Um, and so the, the, the title of the talk is uh, How A-Life and Genetic Algorithms Came into, into Digital Art. So I'm gonna talk about all the work we did uh, late 80s, coinciding with Carl Sims, Richard Dawkins. So I'm going to talk about that history, how it all connected with SIGGRAPH. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about my personal work along that journey, how I first used genetic algorithms. So quite a lot of content, so um, I may as well get started. Uh, the first thing is um, I work with a very close-knit team, in particular Stephen Todd. I've now worked with for 30 years. It was interesting to hear Bill talking about his collaboration that restarted after 41 years. I didn't have to wait so long, it was just 13 years whilst I was stuck in the games industry but managed to escape. Uh, um, so so I, I have some really brilliant programmers that work with me. So here we are, Stephen Todd and I, the IBM UK Scientific Centre, about 1989, we'd written the book Evolutionary Art and Computers by that point. What the photo doesn't show is the big room full of IBM mainframes that were on the floor below. Um, we had a vector general, um, which I think Larry Cuba men has mentioned. Um, so anyway, this, this is us, uh, two young guys uh, cr creating uh, evolutionary art. Um, here we are in a more formal photo. Um, um, and here we are, God knows how many years later, at the Pompidou Center, Stephen fixing some, a few bugs on our v mutator VR experience that was going to open the following day. Uh, so Stephen is an extremely creative programmer and a great mathematician. So it's the, our work is really a combination of me and him working very, very closely together. And we have a complete shorthand. So... Stephen would be here, except he's writing, rewriting one of the interpreters for the Horn Grammar that we're going to be using for some new AI work. Um, so this is 1989, Mutation X. Uh, this is an evolved form, floats in the void of uh, black computer space. It's floating in nothing, nothingness. It looks natural, but it's unnatural at the, the, the same time. It's synthetic, but looks natural. Uh, and this tension is really, really important. If I get it right, the mutations are right, they kind of lodge in people's minds. They kind of, hopefully my forms you will remember, you may not be able to get them out of your mind long term, when, but who knows. Um, this is more recent work. Um, uh, that, the, that's a slightly low resolution. Uh, they have 20,000 pixels. 
And it's interesting being in this space because I've been in it so long, a bit like a 70s rock star. People still like the old stuff, but actually I'm doing a ton of new stuff. And the new AI element we're creating is going to give us a completely new edge. Uh, these are very, very beautiful, and they're, they're uh, produced quite big. Big resurgence of interest in my work as an artist, which is great, on the back of Web3, all the NFT stuff. Uh, so I've never been busy. I'm at a point now, do I open and start another big studio just to keep up with the volume of work? Doing a lot, in, a lot of work in China, no exhibitions in the US for a long, long time. Everything is China or Japan. Um, working with a number of, uh, number of galleries, uh, Gazelli in particular in London, and expanded art here, but then also uh, galleries in China. Uh, so context, so um, Conway's Game of Life has emergent content. You have gliders, you have all this stuff. So this is the foundations, 19th Conway's Game of Life. Fractals, fractals kind of have this emergent quality. Um, and so the context of Maya and Stephen's work in around 1988, 89, was on the back of this explosion of energy with SIGGRAPH, the kind of golden years of SIGGRAPH, Ken Perlin, uh, uh, Jim Blinn, ILM, Pixar, Ken Musgrave, David M, Cellular Automata. It goes on and on. People have written ray tracers. So I come in on the back of all this amazing work. So the ray tracing algorithms that we, we used had been developed through SIGGRAPH. Then what happened was we also had Kawaguchi, great, he's presenting tonight his um, growth algorithms where he's starting to show the kind of grammar that he's using when he's uh, creating his wonderful videos. So on the back of that, plus Richard Dawkins' famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, which was really just an explanation of the way evolution worked, plus my work, plus Carl Sims, all at the same time, we kind of hit on the same idea. It was a really lucky break. Uh, and, and each of us was using an, an evolutionary interface, a pick and breed interface to create uh, imagery. Carl produced some wonderful films. Dawkins uh, created his biomorph system. So in particular with Dawkins' biomorph system, what's really important from my point of view, from this simple branching, branching structure that's being mutated, we start to see all sorts of interesting content like bat, bats or butterflies or centipedes, doesn't really matter. Um, and then in Carl's work, and he uses a slightly different approach, he's using a list programming approach, which makes structure mutation quite easy, which is a big, big plus. And he has a brilliant show at the Pompidou and writes a series of brilliant papers which are shown at SIGGRAPH. Um, so this is all brought together, lots of press, a bit like now, you know, all the hype around AI, there was lots of hype around um, computer graphics, games, the internet, it was only just around for a little while. And so this is Scientific American around 1993, where our work is, is being well publicized. Um, then what happens is the focus moves away from this sort of instance-based mutation towards larger scale uh, a life systems, people like um, Polyworld in particular was a very good one. I won't talk about this too long. Uh, a lot of people ask me about how my work relates to Dawkins, so our work coincided. coincided. He wrote a paper before The Blind Watchmaker that coincided with the form synth drawings that I'd been producing when I was a student. And these were evolutionary rule-based systems using my brain as a computer to draw the result of the transformation. And these are some of the rules. Um, and then off the back of that work, I spent, before that, you know, when I was at the RCA, I spent a lot of time in the Nat Natural History Museum. Well before 1999, I'd become a professor, not a professor, a visiting artist at IBM. And what was brilliant, they had all this software. And in particular, Stephen had just written a new programming language called ESME, which he'd been using for molecular graphics. Um, so off the back of that, uh, relationship, all this new work emerged. So this is Mutator, you see the parent top on the right-hand side, and there's all the children, the children variants. So as an artist, I'm picking and breeding, picking and breeding hundreds and hundreds of times. And the random element creates kind of, sort of elements of disorganization, which I, 
uh, find pleasing. Now, when I'm picking and breeding, I'm in effect doing the Rosh Hashanah inkblot test. I'm just looking at the content, picking what is most exciting to me. And this is the type of stuff in the back of my mind. Uh, uh, tapeworms, maggots, worms, elements that are slightly erotic, you know, death, heavy metal imagery. All that stuff is at play when I'm picking and breeding. Um, and when I get a little bit bored, I just crank up the mutation rate, and then you get some weird forms. Um, what was interesting is that in this space of possibilities, uh, there's an infinite number of potential forms that are out there. Just a slight digression, this is the modeler we're using. It was a CSG modeler, not too many polygons, very nice crevasses, nice shadows. And from that, from that we created this grammar called FormGrow. And FormGrow, we spent a lot of time customizing based on observation of nature, horn on horns, branch of horns, rib cage of horns, fractal horns. Um, and by fine tuning this grammar, when we plug that into mutator, then it's like Pandora's box. You, you open up a world of weird and wonderful forms to explore. So form grow is really, really important. And this is what we spend a lot of time fine tuning. But then when we add mutator on top, this is where you have this evolutionary fruit machine that spins all the numbers a little bit, kicks out variants, and you pick the ones that you don't like, and you kill the ones that you... Uh, you pick the ones you, want, you like, and you kill the ones you don't. Um, so I'm just trying to move forward. And these are some of the results. Uh, that tend to be 1024 resolution. Um, and, you know, it, it just wonderful potential. This is a kind of evolution by aesthetics, and we presented them in galleries all over the place. And they were, they were public find them quite confusing, and still, still do. But in effect, what we're doing is we're navigating this vast multidimensional parameter space. And if you've got a thousand parameters, and each value can be between zero and 10,000, that's a massive space. And so what evolution does is enables you to traverse that space. So it's like an optimizer where the human is the cost function. So the film tonight that Larry is going to show is, is from the evolution of form, where we're literally going from one point in parameter space to another, and we're interpolating between the two points. The interface was very simple, good, bad, marry. There were several types of marry, so you can have different types of crossbreeding uh, where the genes are shared between a number of parents. And the other thing is you can have like 40 parents all contributing to the next set of offspring. Um, just to highlight, the work inextricably is linked to protein structures. So the very first structure that Stephen produced was an adapted protein structure, which we, we're now doing work again in, in that area. So the kind of fundamentals of life were kind of married, tied into the, the project right from the start. So this idea of me as the gardener, why was IBM interested in spending six years on me on all this stuff? Well, they were interested in soft user interfaces, how you um, hide all the numbers from the user and they just pick and read the, what they want. So here, this is an early prototype with, for architects designing houses. And here, we, a few years later with Revit, we re-engineered that. Architects hate it if you say you're gonna be out of a job because you, anyone could just evolve buildings. Um, so jumping forward to 2024, uh, this is our full set of uh, software libraries that we have. We have FormGrow still, refined, and definitely Mutator. We've now got a physics package that's put on top so the forms don't self-intersect. So self-intersection can really be a nice effect where things sort of fold in on themselves. But with the physics now, we can actually have non-intersecting uh, forms. We have the infinity mirror chamber, which is what's producing all the black and white images. And now the important bit is the AI selector. Because one of the big problems when you're mutating forms as a human, after about 200 mutations, you're getting a little bit weary. And probably, you know, the, the good results, probably another 500 iterations ahead. So the aim with the AI se selector is for the AI to perform the same task as the inkblot test. The computer should be able to go from its library of memories and pick the best mutation. 
Um, and so we're not using prompts or anything like that. Um, so that's what, that's what we're working on. And in some ways, the whole AI thing is really interesting. If you work in this space, you feel like it's a big wave behind you. You've got to find a way of exploiting that technology. So Stephen and I have put a lot of effort into this AI selection. And the other key thing, difference between IBM now is real-time interaction. We're doing everything at 90 frames a second in VR. Uh, so none of, so this is v Mutator running at the moment. Um, more variants. Um, this is in VR, so you're put in the middle of a mutating flower-type form. This one's a little bit nightmarish. Um, more beautiful one. So this is um, us with an animating form. So none of this just project a big video on a gallery wall. I, I think the public wants stuff that's interactive. And so we're doing a lot of work with Connect as year at the moment. So the public walk up to the artwork and it spawns geometry based on their movements. So yeah, so we've invested a lot of time in making it real time and run extremely quickly. This is another clip. Uh, this links back to the protein work. So this is a mutated form breaking its, the worms are breaking their structural content, uh, constraints and heading to chaos. So um, this, is, this is brand new work. The, 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 there's no self-intersection. In, and we have this run, running in real time. Um, We've done a lot of work on different types of rendering, inspired a little bit by David Hockney's black and white drawings. Um, recent stuff, highly decorative. Um, hint of arts and craft movement. Hint, yeah, there's lots of references there. So th this is work we're going to be showing in China. Um, this work has been heavily influenced by electron microscopy. Um, which comes out of the science work that we work on. So this is the fantasy virus series that I produced in the midst of COVID. I was aesthetically evolving new viruses, whereas, <laughs> whereas the real virus was... Uh, so this is a body of work that never, never shown. And we, we cut the form open so, um, to, to reveal the, in, the, cent the center a little bit like the way viruses were shown on TV. Uh, so that's a, a close-up. And this is all moving, it's, it's mutating as well. Interestingly, on the, off the back of that, we were approached by Professor Ryden Twerok at the University of York Biology Systems Group to actually use our technology for modeling real viruses. So there's a whole chunk of work I'm not talking about today where our tech, mutator technology is being taken and, and applied in pure science. And what, what is the circular loop, the work we're doing with for example, protein folding folds back into the physics that we're using for the arts. It's a very, very tight relationship with uh, scientific groups around the UK, like uh, Oxford University, Imperial College, etc. But in that space, we're extremely careful to label stuff as science or stuff as art. You never, ever blur make that uh, any, create, have any confusion around that. So that, that's an ongoing project. Um, I think, I, actually, have, have I kept within 20 minutes? I, maybe not quite. Uh, this, this is kind of the history of five minutes. OK, right. Um, so this is the kind of history of the work. Um, yeah, I spent a long time in rave music, a um, lot of but I didn't realize when I was at IBM, all the, a lot of the videos I'd been producing had been shown at rave concerts for years in warehouses and things like that. So when I finished at IBM, I suddenly had, they'd said, well, your audience is not your art crowd. Th this is much more popular. And so then I worked with different bands for quite a few years and then I ended up making computer games, and then I got approached by Universal Studios to make a game based on John Carpenter's film, The Thing, because The Thing f looks a little bit like our, my weird <laughs> organic forms. And then finally, I managed to escape and then got, became a professor at Goldsmiths and then picked up the work and um, took it to the next level. Um, I did have a slide on the kind of legacy, sounds a bit grandiose, legacy. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of artists that 
you know, now, um, like, you know, entangled uh, John McCormack in Australia, Scott Drave. So, having written the book, what the, we made the algorithms quite public, so that I guess you know, the following generation were able to pick it up and um, use those algorithms to, to create great art. And, and you know, sometimes when I'm looking at things, I can say, oh yeah, that's that's that form grow grammar. That particular look comes comes from the book. And I, I think the um, the tie up now with AI is the hard problem. Like you know, a lot of the AI at the moment is mainly using statistics in, in different ways. Um, and, and uh, you know, prompts is getting interesting results. But I, you know, I think how you tie up a generative system with a AI selector. So the idea is that this mutator could be generated for the next thousand years. It wouldn't need me as the artist, the machine, just be able to make its own selection for itself. You know, how we train the the machine to have my aesthetic, I don't know. You know, maybe. We've got a few ideas on that already, um, but I think that's that's the the hard bit that we're working on at the moment. And definitely, given all the competition around AI, that's you know, where there's an inter interesting opportunities. Okay, I think I'm done. But thanks for all the support over the years. Um, great, thank you.